Oh my God, what if I said Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory? <laughs> Would you murder me? <laughs> no, he's not a hero of mine. Hi, I'm Patty. And I'm Prithvi. And welcome to Scientist Talk Movies. Yeah, so Patty, well, we have known each other for a while, um, and we've even gone observing together in uh, Hawaii, but we do work on different things. So do you want to maybe talk about what specific research you're working on right now? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I'm doing a project right now. I do observational astronomy. So basically, like you said, we go either go physically to a telescope or do remote observations just here at Davis. And we target specific galaxies is what I'm looking at. So I'm analyzing basically some of the first galaxies ever formed. It's in this cosmic era called reionization. So basically the whole universe was neutral hydrogen. And then at some point, which is where I'm looking, it all got reionized by something. Right. And the strongest candidate for causing reionization right now is these young star forming new galaxies at the time. So we're looking back just to give a time scale at around like 13 and a half billion years ago. And the universe is like 14 billion years old. So we're only looking 500 million years after the Big Bang, which is when these galaxies first started forming. So I'm doing spectroscopy on these galaxies, just looking for emission lines of basically what chemicals, um, chemical signals we can get from them to try and basically solve the mystery of reionization, like over what time scale it occurred, how exactly it happened and stuff like that. So it's a very, there are a lot of different mini subfields people go into within reionization. Um, but yeah, I'm just looking at spectra from galaxies that were formed around that era to kind of see what their role was in that process. And what exactly are you doing right now? Yeah, so just like you, I came into grad school really wanting to be an observational astronomer. And then I had a really hard time picking my advisor because I felt conflicted, especially during my first year of grad school, after I realized that there's all these people also working on computer simulations in astronomy and astrophysics. And then I was really torn as to whether I wanted to be an observational astronomer or a computational one. Although now I've settled upon being more of a computational astronomer and working more with simulations of galaxy formation, I really am still interested in trying to see if we can achieve some kind of synthesis of the two. Mm -hmm. And to try and see if we can either build better simulations using what we observe as a guide or whether we can try and use the simulations to understand some of the things we observe, especially if we don't know what the mechanism causing those observations. Right. And so right now I'm working with these simulations that are supposed to be a model of how our own Milky Way galaxy formed. But I'm for the rest of my thesis, what I hope to do is to try and modify those simulations or use a somewhat different set of simulations to see if we can actually use them to understand older galaxies. So that's kind of where I think our um, areas would overlap a little more, where can we use simulations to understand what these galaxies were doing 13 billion years ago? Right. Um, and I don't really have a good answer to that yet because I've only recently gotten more of an introduction to these simulations, but we'll see. Um, yeah. We're going to be in grad school for another three or four years. So yeah. We'll <laughs> I'm kind of jealous of things like Milky Way observers where it's yeah. right there and you yeah. bright stars everywhere. How did you get interested in astronomy and science or how did you even choose this field at all? Honestly, I'd love to have a story about how I was like looking at a meteor shower or something as a five-year-old, but I don't really. And as far as science is concerned, I grew up in a family where there were a lot of doctors, like medical doctors. And so I've, I've kind of been surrounded by that growing up. and. Uh, you know, my parents would sometimes bring me into the clinic and I would see stuff around. So uh, I think ever since then, I've 
kind of been into the whole STEM thing, but as far as physics and astronomy is concerned, I wasn't really thinking of that as a serious career choice before college. Um, I was decently good at physics in high school. And honestly, I went into college thinking I was going to be an engineering major. Um, my parents really wanted me to be an engineering major. It's like the classic Asian parent thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I hated the engineering classes in college. And, you know, that's not to say I hated engineering as a concept, but I just didn't really enjoy the classes. Uh, and I ended up really liking some of the astronomy classes that I tried out. And that's that's when I started seriously considering it as something I wanted to do after college as well. Oh, so you went in as an engineering major? Yeah, I was thinking of something along the lines of aerospace engineering. I was still okay. into the idea of space, but yeah. uh, now I'm something approaching it from a different <laughs> <laughs> perspective. Yeah, That's sweet. I didn't know that. Yeah. What about you? I kind of do a story. Well... I grew up with a sister who's a year and a half older than me and she and I were home alone like every summer while our parents worked. Um, we grew up in Wisconsin. We would, we didn't have cable. So on mm. PBS once there was the history channel, um, put on this thing. It's called the universe. That's actually on Netflix. Now season one just came out on Netflix. If you want to watch it. And we would watch it like every day when we were home alone and we got obsessed with it. And we just, it goes through like everything like goes like solar systems and like big bang, black holes, all the exciting astronomy topics. All the cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the stuff people care about most. <laughs> um, so we would watch that. And I remember being like, Katie, can we like do this for a living? And she was like, yeah, let's look into it. And she's actually doing her PhD in physics now too. She's two years above me. So we both ended up going into that. And it was interesting, like from there, I always thought I was gonna be majoring in music when I went mm. to college. Cause I was, I grew up playing traditional Irish music and classical flute. So I thought I'd be going into like studying classical flute throughout all of college and high school. That was kind of my trajectory. Um, I was like super involved in um, solo and ensemble work and stuff. So I went in to Boston College as a double physics and music major. And then I realized it was way too much work because the physics major had the most requirements or most credits for any major. Um, so I dropped to music minor. I keep like I still play Irish music all the time. But yeah, I found out that I could get like an actual career <laughs> in physics. Mm -hmm. And then I still just do music as a pastime. I've heard you play flute and you're really good, but I didn't realize you started off as a double major. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah it was just way too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't really play much classical anymore, but I like Irish way better anyway. So <laughs> that's all I do now. I guess we've you've already kind of mentioned a TV show that you used to watch. But, yeah. Um, do you have any other movies that you really like that are science themed? I was a huge Harry Potter kid growing up. Just same as the Harry yeah, Potter t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went to all the like midnight premieres and stuff at our theater, like sat there first in line five hours before midnight and whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, we didn't really watch much TV when I was like, because we didn't have cable or anything. Um, my mom had like 10 DVDs that we'd watch over and over, mostly like Christmas movies, <laughs> sound of music and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, the main thing that mostly influenced me is when I found that universe show <laughs> and my mm -hmm. sister and I were just so obsessed with it. Did you have anything that influenced you? Well, it's it's funny that you mentioned Harry Potter because I never, honestly, I'd never thought about Harry Potter as, you know, um, also having science related themes in it. This is mm -hmm. while growing up. But I was just thinking about this the other day that the only time they really mention astronomy related things in Harry Potter are when they're doing astrology right and that, that really bothered me when I was thinking about this like a couple of weeks ago that I right. really wish there had been some real astronomy representation but yeah I suppose that's a little hard to weave into the whole magical narrative You're right yeah and what is interesting with that too is you know like the Less strange family tree. Yeah. Like Belichick, yeah. They're all named after like stars and cons, like Drake. They are. Drama. Yeah. Yeah. There is, Serious. Yeah. There's an Andromeda. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's like the evil family, right? Yeah. <laughs> With some yeah. good people. So, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting thing to notice. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I mean, apart from that, you know, a sort of science and space movie that 
I watched a fair bit when I was younger was the Apollo 13 movie, mm. which it, it's like the original Apollo 13 movie that focused right. the the disaster and how everyone in NASA on, you know, in admission control kind of scrambled to try and find some kind of solution to it. And yeah. you'll notice I have a Saturn V picture or poster oh, yeah. over there. <laughs> But um, I was super into the Apollo missions as a kid. That was the movie that I thought was just really cool because it was what I imagined at the time astronauts did every single day. Right. And I realize now that their work is very different from what I thought it was. Right. (laughs) um, It it was pretty influential on me as a kid. Yeah. Would you ever want to be an astronaut or go into space at all? (laughs) There there was a time when I really wanted to. um, And... My mom has this anecdote that I don't remember because apparently it's from when I was four years old where um, I think we were watching something on TV and she asked me if I want to go to the moon and I said something along the lines of only if you come with me. Oh, um, And cute. I definitely had a phase when I really wanted to be an astronaut, but yeah. it's, it's funny. I don't really have that phase anymore. And I know. I think it's super cool, but it just doesn't, uh, the possibility of me becoming an astronaut just doesn't excite me as much anymore. I'd rather study astronomy. <laughs> Same here. Yeah, I feel like I missed the chance. To, like, you know, it's so hard and such technical training. And I feel like you have to be experienced in multiple fields. I feel like I missed that. <laughs> but maybe if SpaceX does the, the like casual trips by the time we're alive <laughs> to take us to the moon. Yeah. I would do that. And I think you can still apply, though, if you want. Um, oh, yeah. Apparently, there's been a lot of interest amongst the astronomy community in the latest astronaut application cycle, and everyone's just been applying for the heck of it. Wow. Um, but yeah. I, yeah. I know <laughs> I people in our department applied. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you tell me more about the show? I don't think I've ever heard of it. Have you seen CBS it? Universe show? No. But yeah. I think I, it's originally like History Channel. It. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, it's on Netflix now, which is just the first season. There's tons of seasons. It's mostly like computer graphic design, like simulation, like artist renditions of stuff. So like it grasped me as a kid, you know, and it's all accurate. Like they interview like cosmologists and astrophysicists mm-hmm. and stuff. But yeah, they just like kind of show dramatizations and like visuals of stars being um, pulled into black holes and like things like that that the people want to see (laughs) so yeah it just basically is like accessible astronomy education for like all ages kind of like the carl sagan cosmos yeah exactly i've seen a couple of the carl sagan ones and then do you watch the new one at all the neil degrasse tyson no and you know, as we keep talking more about this, I feel really embarrassed because I feel like I should have watched all these things. But I know. I no, <laughs> me too. I've seen like, yeah, even the new one, the Neil deGrasse one was on Netflix, like everything. And I watched like a few episodes, you know, like same with the comet that was just up. Everyone's like, like when I saw my friends last week from out of town, they were like, oh, how was the comet? I was like, I didn't even see it once. <laughs> they yeah. were like, you're an astronomer. I feel yeah. really guilty about stuff like that. Where like, I should be more on it. I'm not. <laughs> yeah. And I think if there's one misconception that I'd like for people to be more aware of when it comes to professional astronomy, it's, it's that professional astronomers are often very bad at stargazing. Oh my God. And yeah. just because I the work know, we like, do day to day is so different. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know any constellations that people always ask. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and uh, speaking of Carl Sagan, I guess another misconception. So one of the books that I really liked, and I kind of discovered this in high school, but I got really into this book in college, was Contact. And it's, it's written by Carl Sagan. It's a novel. It's a novel that explores a lot of astronomy-related themes. So it talks about um, the, the protagonist is this astronomer named Ellie. And she's a radio astronomer, and she's the first to make contact with an alien civilization. She works with SETI, um, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And uh, it's, a, it's a really cool, cool book. It has all these themes of, you know, debating science versus religion and how those can coexist or how they're different from each other. But one of the things that I 
that really annoyed me about the contact movie was that they showed the scientist using data from a radio telescope and they showed her take Taking headphones and plugging them into the telescope. Oh no! And I, I just kept thinking, that's not how you do it. That's really yeah, it. yeah. That's so but, funny. <laughs> uh, but I really, really enjoyed the book, and yeah. the movie was fun too. It's just that whole headphone radio telescope thing really got me. That's really funny. Yeah, and oh, Jodie Foster funny. stars in it as the astronomer. Okay. Oh god! Yeah, I feel like there's so many like little inaccuracies because obviously Hollywood's not going to know mm-hmm, <laughs> like mm-hmm. that. But um, the one, what was the one that it was, they hired like a cosmologist, a theoretical. Oh, interstellar. Yes. Yeah, I remember yeah. that was such a big deal because it was yeah. the first like actually accurate <laughs> like space movie. Yeah, I agree. And um, I think they hired Kip Thorne yes. as the consultant. And that was it they showed all those black hole simulations and, and yeah, that was super cool. Um, no. It was cool that they made them so realistic and they used actual, you know, simulations to show those. Exactly. You don't really have TV shows or movies that talk about how much, you know, astronomy or science is about just reading and writing on a mm-hmm. day-to-day basis, because I feel like I'm just reading papers and exactly. eventually you get to the point where you're writing your papers or applying for grants. But uh, I imagine that no one would want to watch that. Exactly. <laughs> if you just show a scientist just reading papers. Yeah, That's for real. Kind of yeah. yeah, like a lot of my family was shocked. They're like, oh, what's happening with your job? They're, like with COVID and stuff. They're like, are you still able to work? I was like, all my work's on a computer. So it doesn't matter. And they're always so shocked by that. They're like, what about looking at the stars? Like, we maybe look at stars a couple nights a year <laughs> and mm-hmm. then spend the rest of the year looking at that data. <laughs> and I mean, we, we have the advantage of being able to control telescopes even from our homes, right? Exactly. If we wanted to. Yeah, so, even if we observe, uh, I could do yeah. it from here. <laughs> like you said, we've known each other for two years. So you've heard me talk about Star Trek a lot. Oh my God. That's, <laughs> that's been like the biggest influence on me as far as movies and TV shows are concerned. <laughs> Um, and I, w- I would put that squarely in the TV show category because while there have been 13 Star Trek movies, wow. most of them have been terrible. Really? And it's the TV shows that are so much better. Oh my um, God. I've never seen yeah. a single one. I know you're going to yeah. hate me for that. No, no. no. <laughs> um, I, I know they're not, they don't quite have the mass appeal of Star Wars. I'm not quite sure why that is. I think part of it has to do with the fact that the first Star Trek um, series is just so old now. Like it was made in the early 60s and yeah. it's very, very campy. And right. it's just... Is that the know, William Shatner? It's the William Shatner one. Okay. And, and you know, if, if you look really hard, it still does have all these really interesting themes um, that you can follow in all the different episodes. But... If you're not, if you're new to the Star Trek universe um, and you watch the original series from the 60s, mm-hmm. I, I feel like everyone's gut reaction would just be, oh, wow, this is so 60s. Right. You know? And yeah. it's, it's just got all these really kooky special effects. And, you know, uh, uh, the, the theme song is played on a theremin. And I feel like, you, what even theremin? is that instrument? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't even know. But I would say if, if you want a much better introduction to Star Trek um the second and the third series so okay. the next generation and Deep Space Nine Deep Space um, Nine <laughs> they're so they were both made in the late 80s early 90s mm-hmm. and so you know they got much better with the special effects and they also got much better at not having them be super campy and tacky right um, and even even a lot of the themes and the storylines they go into are you know, evolved with time as well. And, yeah. Um, honestly, I've gotten to the point where I like watching Star Trek just for the stories, not so much for the science fiction anymore. Wow. Uh, because, the, of course, the science fiction is there, you know, and mm-hmm. um, that's what originally got me into it as a kid. Mm-hmm. But then you realize it's mostly a show about the human condition and they talk about, you know, racism. They talk about what would happen if you have a society that doesn't have money as a concept 
it's all these interesting themes that they can explore because it's set in the future. Most of the episodes just deal with all these thematic concepts that you just cannot do when you have shows that are set in 2020. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know Sorry. It. That was a lot about Star Trek. Yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> but I can, I can keep talking about it, but I think I should. Stop. I know. Oh my God. I'll have to watch it at some point. Yeah. I would I would highly recommend starting with the next generation, next generation. I- instead of the original series. Okay. Um, with the warning that even the first couple of seasons of the next generation have pretty low moments, but it it gets better. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Is it like Doctor Who, where I'm going to get like sucked in and involved and have to watch? <laughs> like when I started Doctor Who, I watched yeah. the like the new like the David Tennant ones. And I finished that. I was like, well, now I have to go back and like start with the first doctor and <laughs> do the whole thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Since since we've spoken about, you know, um, the representation of what working in astronomy or science is actually like, one other feeling I have is that, so so I grew up in India before coming to the U.S. for college. And one thing that's still really disappoints me is that in pretty much every single movie or tv show that i've watched from back in india anytime they show a scientist it's someone in a chemistry lab wearing a lab and uh, of course it's usually like a male scientist because it's it's not like indian television or movies are you know uh, progressive in that sense but there's a certain image people have, you know, and there's a certain image in the public eye that, oh, if you're a scientist, you must be in some kind of lab. And um, that's something that I wish movies and TV shows would do a better job of, of yeah. just showing the diversity and the kinds of science you can do and the diversity in lifestyle that scientists can have. Right. Because of course you have so many people who do work in chemistry labs and have to wear lab coats every single day, but you also have so many people who don't don't yeah yeah yeah. on that front in like in shows like csi whenever they like have to take sample to the lab or something it's always this like hot young 23 year old scientist i was like they don't have a phd (laughs) not (laughs) strung out and like (laughs) losing their hair (laughs) so yeah they always make them look like I don't know, like just young, beautiful people who are also experts in this really technical field, <laughs> which you can be like attractive in a scientist, like, yeah. but they're always so young. <laughs> like, yeah, put yeah, together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, although I, I think one thing movies in general tend to do pretty well is show the interactions between um, scientists and the people they report to, especially when it's people in government. Yeah, uh, because a lot of movies tend to, uh, especially the disaster movies, they tend to portray that those kinds of interactions, and then you always have the scientists um, warning people of some disaster to come, and it's always the people in the administration or the bureaucrats who are trying to ignore what the scientists are right. Saying. And yeah. I feel like, especially right now with COVID, there's a lot of that going around. Right. And you know, you you think that kind of stuff only happens in disaster movies, but it's happening every day in reality. Yeah, um, yeah and in the movies, right when you're watching it, you're like, why would you believe them? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something that I watched recently, speaking of COVID, since we've all been watching so much more TV and so much more Netflix these days, yeah. um, I watched this new series about the Space Force, which... <gasps> Don't get comedy? me started on the Space Force, but yeah, yeah, the one with yeah. Steve. Yeah, yeah, um, we started that, and I just thought it was so. It's it's one of those things that I felt like I could just switch off my brain and watch because so obvious that they're just trying to show how bad of an idea the Space Force is, yeah. and how badly it's being managed and executed by the current administration. Yeah. But um, that's. That was really fun to watch. I didn't get through all of it, but the couple of episodes that I have seen, I just thought it was funny. (laughs) Me too. Yeah. Yeah. I think I only watched the first couple, but I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. And I thought it did a really good job of, um, again, showing that dynamic between the scientists in the Space Force. And then you have Steve Carell, who plays the protagonist, who's like 
a four-star general, I think. Right, yeah. There's all these times when he's just completely ignoring what the scientists are telling him. Exactly. Oh, have you seen that remind me of um, Hidden Figures? Yeah, the one? yeah, I did yeah. watch that. I really want to read the book because I think I've heard from a lot of people that the book goes into a lot more than the movie does, yeah. especially in terms of representation, which, you know, to some extent is understandable because it, you have a two-hour movie. Right. And they obviously want to try and cram some drama and story yeah. into that as well. That's that's definitely a book that's on my reading list that I haven't gotten Yeah, to. Yeah, I like how they did show, like, the massive stacks of, like, computation that goes into, like, a mission like that. Like, they were just checking all the math by hand and stuff like that. So I thought that, that, that like, kind of accurately portrayed all the stuff that goes behind any kind of space mission. Yeah, yeah. And especially back then, right, when they yeah. didn't when they had to have people do those computations. Right. And then it, it was it was the women and the black people who were doing those computations. Yeah. They weren't allowed to work on anything else. And you have pretty much the same thing that happened in astronomy research as well, right? Not just the aerospace industry or not just NASA, where right. back in the early 20th century, you had so many women that were hired by astronomy departments just to do those mundane, like really mechanical calculations. Yeah, exactly. Um, but they couldn't or anything. Yeah. Right, right. And there's so many things that came out of those calculations without the people who did them getting credited. Yeah, for real. Thanks so much for catching up and chatting with me, Pratik, even though we can't see each other in person. <laughs> it's really nice to talk to you. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And especially since, you know, um, we would normally be having a fair number of casual conversations in the department that we can't anymore. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely been super nice. And for all the viewers out there, please be sure to look out for the next episode of Scientists Talk Movies.